Uh, okay, friends, uh, welcome to part two of our video presentation on chapter eight. Uh, just to put things a bit into context, uh, the first part of chapter eight uh, talks about the so-called uh, systems uh, thinking view. And uh, there are many terms for that systems uh, thinking view, for example, uh, socio-technical perspective of information system or uh, soft systems met methodology. Uh, but the key defining characteristic of the systems view is that uh, information technology uh, is not viewed in isolation from people and uh, organizational uh, issues. So that's, that's the essence of the systems uh, thinking perspective. And I would say in many ways uh, this perspective or this philosophy defines uh, what information systems uh, field is all about. So the first part of chapter 8 introduces you to those uh, you know, key systems concepts under the umbrella of the systems uh, thinking view. Now, the, the rest of chapter 8, uh, after, the, after the systems view is introduced, the rest of chapter 8 uh, talks largely about systems analysis and design. Uh, a lot of ideas, techniques, uh, frameworks, and uh, specific methodologies uh, are discussed under the umbrella of systems analysis and design. And naturally, uh, all those system analysis and design concepts and techniques, uh, they're intimately linked to the systems perspective. In other words, this uh, socio-technical perspective on how information, how organizational problems need to be analyzed and uh, how information system solution for those organizational problems needs to be developed. So that's uh, what, uh, what the second part of Chapter 8 is all about. It's about uh, various ideas and uh, methodologies uh, under the umbrella of systems analysis and design and how those methodologies are linked uh, to the systems uh, view perspective. But in this, uh, in this particular part of our video presentation, uh, we will largely uh, talk about uh, business processor engineering on BPR. But before we do that, we'll just talk more about the link uh, between the so-called uh, socio-technical perspective or, or systems thinking and various uh, system analysis and design uh, methods or ideas. Well, some of the uh, some some of the ways in which uh, the systems view influence system analysis and design. Some of the fundamental ways in which systems view influence the system analysis and design uh, are are, are uh, explained here on this slide. Uh, one of, one of those <coughs> fundamental ideas is that uh, a system analyst needs to be very careful when it comes to choosing uh, a system scope. Now, scope, as you probably well know, means the size of the project. It's very important to select uh, the boundary uh, for, an inf for, for, for the information system uh, that is supposed to address a particular problem because the boundaries uh, of that project or the boundaries of the information system that you're planning to develop, you know, they define or they influence complexity uh, of the entire project and ultimately, uh, you know, ultimately influence success of the entire project. So the principle here is that the narrower the scope, you know, the, the smaller the organizational problem that you're trying to address with an information system, the better it is. Because if you, as a project manager or as a system analyst or a general manager, if you, uh, you know, try to wrap your head around a big organization issue, most likely you will fail because the complexity will be just out of control. Uh, principle of system analysis and design number two, a very high level overreaching principle. Logical design before physical design. In other words, don't jump into designing technical solutions before you really, really understand uh, what an information system needs to needs to do on the business or logical side. In other words, decide what needs to be done, what the system needs to accomplish first, before you specify how assist, how uh, this particular system will operate from a technical standpoint. Seems like a very uh, simple and obvious idea, and, and, and <coughs> seems like a very simple and uh, obvi obvious idea, but this uh, factor is always over or tends to be overlooked by technical uh, professionals. Uh, you know, somebody who is well versed in a particular technology, let's say Java, you know, always jumps into to technical details and sometimes forgets that ultimately information systems should be built to address a particular organizational problem or to pursue a particular opportunity for the organization. So, uh, so the analysis needs to start with this, with the understanding of this problem or opportunity and, and how, in principle, right? How, in principle, this problem can be addressed before any kind of technical details are specified. But I see it over and over again, you know, in, in my own experience as well, where technical specialists, they quickly jump into some kind of technical solution before understanding the logic of things. So those two are very fundamental principles from the systems thinking perspective that influence system analysis and design. 
Uh, some other principles, uh, fundamental principles from systems thinking that influence system analysis and design are as follows. Uh, the, the, you know, the third one is kind of related to scope. Uh, a problem is usually a set of, an, an organizational problem is usually a set of problems. And uh, to narrow the scope, you need to focus on one uh, small aspect of that problem because everything is related to everything. And I'm sure, you know, no matter which organizational problem you take, there will be hundreds or dozens or maybe thousands of different factors uh, being all interlinked. So you need to select which specific factor you will address. And of course, hopefully this specific factor should, should uh, produce the highest ROI from that project. In other words, addressing this, this specific factor should uh, you know, create a big improvement in organizational performance. Another principle that is common to many system analysis and design methods, uh, a single solution is not usually obvious to all stakeholders, at least not from the, from the beginning uh, of a particular project. So alternative solutions representing all parties, all stakeholders, should be generated and evaluated before a final solution is selected. In other words, don't jump to solutions, don't jump to conclusions. You know, let stakeholders express their perspective and you know, their ideas on how a particular problem needs to be solved. Uh, principle number five. Uh, this principle is largely related to agility and it's uh, being implemented in a lot of agile methodologies, for example, Scrum, which is an agile project management methodology. So the principle uh, goes something like this. Uh, the problem and your under understanding of this problem could change over time. I mean, things change. Environment change, organizations change, people change. So instead of uh, focusing on developing a solution and then you know, working on that solution in the long run, you need to focus on that stage or incremental approach where you know, your understanding of the problem and your uh, solution you know, change as the environment, as the problem, as the organization change. So, so the idea is that you need to be agile, you need to be adaptable to change as opposed to fixing uh, the problem and finding like some kind of fixed solution. It's just simply not realistic. I mean, this is not how things work in real life. So once again, those were like some fundamental ideas from, from the systems thinking perspective that influence uh, various systems analysis and design uh, methodologies and uh, you know, approaches. Now, what are we going to talk about next? We will talk about uh, business processor engineering. Now, business process engineering can be viewed as one, uh, you know, broad uh, category of system analysis and design, or should I say, redesign techniques uh, that that uh, have been uh, quite quite popular since uh, approximately the 1990s. Now, in the 1990s, there was this movement within many organizations where, you know, in order to become more competitive, in order to improve performance, organizations switched from that functional approach where things were man ma managed at the level of departments of functions like marketing, R&D, finance, and to focus uh, on, on the granular process-oriented approach. So in other words, organizations, they, they, started, uh, you know, they, started increase, they started paying increasing attention to their uh, business processes. Why? I think it's related to this uh, general shift from uh, you know, manufacturing and production economies across the globe uh, more towards you know, service-based economies. In other words, uh, in, in many countries around the globe, uh, the, the proportion uh, of service companies or information-intensive companies or organizations uh, has increased. And if you think about any uh, service organization or information-intensive organization, such as, I don't know, bank or a university or a software company, you will see that largely their business is all about carrying out processes. I mean, it's not about manufacturing, it's about carrying out processes. And most of those processes, they're informational processes. In other words, they either involve uh, processing of data into information into some kind of meaningful form, or they are heavily, uh, you know, they are heavily dependent on informational resources of an organization. So that's why a lot of organizations they started focusing on analyzing and improving their business processes. Now, what is a, what is a business process? Well, typically, a business process is defined as a chain or collection of activities required to achieve a particular outcome. For example, order fulfillment or, purchase or materials acquisition can be examples of two processes. Uh, many business gurus in the early 1980s urged companies to radically change the way they did business. Uh, you know, they, some, some of those ideas were quite radical where companies were advised to start with a clean state and then just rebuild their entire organization process by process utilizing information technology. So, for example, one of those gurus uh, said, don't automate, ob obliterate, meaning, you know, just uh, eradicate uh, everything, uh, all those old and efficient processes and create new ones. So 
So that was uh, that was the the fashion, I guess, the managerial fashion in nineteen nineties. Uh, by the way, uh, you know, it looks like BPR or business processor engineering has lost some of its appeal. In other words, it's not as commonly discussed as it was back in nineteen nineties. But you understand that this is not going anywhere. I mean, any organization, in essence, is a collection of business processes. And if you want to change organization, you need to change its, uh, you know, organizational process. That, that's that's what it is. It's not going anywhere. Um, in fact, I remember uh, one of my research projects uh, when I was a doctoral student at the University of Houston was uh, PeopleSoft implementation at the University of Houston. And uh, you know, PeopleSoft is that ERP system that can pretty much power anything, any any process within a uh, within a university. And it was interesting that uh, when, when, when consultants started this project, and it was like a very long, very expensive, very complicated project, uh, for the first thing they did, they basically spelled out uh, all key processes at the University of Houston. In other words, uh, they uh, decomposed the entire organization into a collection of processes. And then for each process, they just spelled out you know, how this process will be re-engineered, how this process will be changed as a result of implementing PeopleSoft. So that was the thinking back then, and that was the approach. You know, it's viewing everything in, in terms of processes and uh, improving organizational performance by re-engineering those processes. Uh, which brings us to the uh, topic of business processor engineering, or BPR, which is a common acronym. Now, BPR is usually understood as a radical business redesign uh, in, uh, initiatives uh, that attempt to achieve dramatic improvement in business processes by questioning the assumptions or business rules that underline the organization's structure and procedures. So once again, uh, BPR in involves uh, re-evaluating organizational processes by questioning the assumptions, the rules, the beliefs, and uh, the, the, the value of those processes. So it's, it's a system analysis and redesign uh, method that is focused uh, on business processes. Now, in the early days of BPR, there have been uh, many and widely publicized examples of uh, you know, BPR being used successfully in well-known organizations to achieve uh, improvements in performance. For example, Ford uh, Motor Company improved, uh, reported 75% you know, improvement in, uh, you know, in, in its processes uh, after questioning some of the assumptions you know, behind certain processes and re-engineering you know, those uh, processes. So that was done in relation to accounts payable. As you know, uh, Ford Motor Company, just like any manufacturing organization, has, uh, you know, has a very complicated uh, web of relationships with suppliers, so accounts payable is a very important strategic area for, for any kind of auto manufacturer. Uh, then another company, Mutual Benefit Life Insurance, uh, you know, as an, it, it was able to improve uh, some of its organizational processes. As, a, as an example, uh, the company changed the process that involved the 19 people in five departments so that the process could be accomplished by one person. And as a result of BPR, uh, on average, time to issue policy decreased from three weeks to three hours. So that was quite an improvement in, in their performance. Of course, there are some, some examples of failures as well, but in the early 1990s, everybody was talking about the, the positive side of BPR. Now, so, so what, what is at the heart of business process re-engineering? Re well, at the heart of business process re-engineering is the idea that certain processes are very important, okay? And some processes are not important, and they can be easily abandoned. For example, you can take a process and ask uh, the following questions in order to analyze the importance of that process for, for your organization. Does process X define uh, your firm to customers, employees, and investors? If the answer is yes, it means you know it's 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 a process that is important for your identity. You shouldn't eliminate it. You shouldn't maybe you shouldn't automate it. You shouldn't streamline it. For example, um, let's say if you're selling um, you know luxury vehicles, let's say Ferraris or Bentleys, then the process of inviting a customer to the showroom, you know, on the one hand, like from from the pure pure rational perspective, it may seem like a redundant process. You know, somebody can argue, well, you can do it online. You know, you, a customer can look at cars online. But it's something that is central to the identity of a lot of uh, you know, companies producing luxury vehicles such as Bentley or Rolls Royce. Because when you go to their dealership or when you go to their showroom, you're treated as a royalty. You know, you're giving all kinds of attention. So a lot of people, you know, they view it as a part of the, of the company's identity. So in that case, probably this process should not be eliminated. If no, if it's not central, if the process is not central to the identity of a company, you may ask the following question. Is excelling at process X critically important to business and performance? 
uh, you know, if yes, uh, that becomes a priority process, and you know, a lot of efforts need to be devoted uh, to this process in order to improve it, and as a result, improve organizational performance. If the answer is no, uh, the question becomes: uh, Does uh, process X provide necessary support to other processes? If if the answer is yes, you know, it means that the process may not be uh, may not be very important uh, on its own. However, it serves as a foundation, as a platform for other important processes. So in that case, again, you should be careful with this process, and you know, if you can improve it, then you will improve a lot of other processes that are running on the background. Uh, if no, then you need to ask the following question. Does the firm carry this process only because it's legally required? Again, if the answer is yes, it means there's nothing you can do with it. You need to keep the process. You cannot eliminate it. Perhaps you can try to streamline it. Uh, but if the answer is no, it means it's a folklore. Now, it's, it's something that people do because they believe that it needs to be done for example, if you ever observe, uh, you know, well, first of all, uh, there's, a, there's a quote from Warren Buffett that goes something like this, uh, you know, something like, Lis listening to your gut feeling, you know, uh, lead, leads to some uh, amazing insights, but at the same time teaches you uh, to spin around three times before you lay down. So he was talking about, like, observing uh, pets like dogs, you know, before they lay down, they, you know, they spin around three times, now nobody knows why they do it, and def, you know it looks like you know spinning around three times uh, doesn't have any impact on the comfort of sleep. But nevertheless, they do it because they believe it's something. They believe you know that it's something that needs to be done. So those kind of processes, you know, they are folklore and they should be abandoned or eliminated. In my experience, uh, I remember uh, when I was trying to re-engineer uh, business processes in the admissions department, especially in relation to uh, graduate business program. Uh, uh, to, in relation to graduate business programs that I was running, I remember I almost like went through, through the entire chain. In other words, uh, there, there were like a couple of processes that I was trying to eliminate, and I was trying to persuade, peop persuade people at the admissions department to eliminate those processes because I felt that they're redundant. You know, they they make things more complicated. They you know, they lead to lower satisfaction of students and so forth. And I remember like there was like one uh, last argument, and I was at some point they told me like. Well, the reason we are doing X is because it's mandated by the Ministry of Education. And at that point I said, okay, can you please show me the exact, uh, you know, the exact uh, decree or the exact rule of the Ministry of Education that mandates you to do this? And they couldn't show me anything and then said, well, there was some kind of email, you know, somebody sent from the Ministry sent us an email years ago, and in that, e in that email, you know, this was required, okay? Again, I couldn't find any email, and eventually they kind of gave up, and they, they agreed to at least uh, eliminate not all of the processes that I wanted to be eliminated or abandoned, but some of them. So this is the thinking. Like some processes, they need to stay, and they need to improve, in, and they need to be improved. Uh, perhaps some processes shouldn't be touched at all, but some processes are obviously redundant and should be eliminated. So, so that's the, the logic of business process reengineering. Uh, some of the uh, key principles for, for BPR, uh, first of all, you need to organize business processes around outcomes, uh, not tasks. Uh, because if you organize processes around outcomes, you know, you will see like what are the processes, what, what are the common processes, meaning what is the set of processes that lead to one common outcome. Because if you look at, at the task level, then you may have redundancy. You may have processes that are part of different tasks, but they accomplish essentially the same thing. In other words, they have the same kind of outcome. Uh, another principle, assign those who use the output to perform the process because if they are the final recipients of the process or the outcome uh, of the process, then they're in a better position to advise you on how a process needs to be redesigned. Uh, integrate information processing into the work that produces uh, the information. Uh, what this principle means to me is that uh, information processing, it's not free. It needs to be recognized as a tangible part uh, of any business process. So. You know, analyzing something, you know, as a part of a particular process should not be viewed as something that is easy. So information processing should also be taken into account. Uh, another principle, don't be afraid to create a virtual, a virtual enterprise by treating geographically distributed resources or, or, or processes or employees as though they were centralized. In other words, nowadays with the advancement of information and communication technologies, especially the Internet, it's possible to make people, uh, you know, for example, in dispersed geographical location to collaborate on common processes, and uh, all this will lead to, you know, integrated, streamlined process as opposed to treating, you know, different, let's say, uh, uh, geographical units as, uh, you know, isolated units. Something that leads to uh, process duplication and inefficiencies. Uh, I think it means link, link parallel activities instead of integrating uh, their results. 
Um, par parallel activities can, you know, maybe you can find some kind of overlap between uh, parallel processes so that, you know, you can, you can eliminate some of the redundancies. Uh, this principle is largely about integration of synergies. You know, make sure you uh, you aggregate the processes that can be aggregated, so there is there's no redundancy and there's better coordination and better synergies across those processes. Uh, another principle that has overlap with some other principle: have people who do the work make all the decisions and let controls built into the system monitor the process. Uh, meaning, uh, again, people who who are, who are recipient of a particular outcome of a process, they need to make decisions about how the process needs to be improved. And ideally, uh, controls need to be built into the process itself. I mean, how to do it is a, you know, it's a difficult question, but you know, it needs, you know, ideally a process needs to be designed in a way where on its own it's uh, it's protected from, uh, from inefficiencies or some kind of... Uh, uh, willing attempts to sabotage it, so that that's the idea. Instead of somebody just standing over the shoulder and monitoring, uh, watching over the, over the shoulder of people who are involved in that particular process. So those are like a very high level engineering principles for business process redesign. Uh, nowadays, uh, uh, the uh, you know the, nowadays it became very common to use information technology to redesign processes. So processes are changed with the help of information technology. For example, field personnel such as sales and customer support staff need to physically be located in an office to, to, to transmit and receive customer and product data. Uh, now, with the help of information technology, you can uh, equip those field personnel with portable computers with communication software and, uh, with, commu with software that can communicate over a wireless network so that they can remotely access company data. So in that case, in, you know, the field personnel, instead of processing customer requ requests in the office, They'll be there, you know, in the field, and they'll be responding to customers whenever their response is needed. Uh, I'll post a paper that I recently published in in, uh, in a journal, and this paper is largely about using mobile technologies such as cell phones, portable computers, to re-engineer a lot of organizational processes for the purpose of improving organizational agility. So there you'll find a lot of examples of uh, specific ideas on how processes can be re-engineered with, with uh, information technology, but more specifically, the mobile technology. Okay, friends, so this concludes uh, part two of our video presentation on Chapter 8. Uh, thank you for listening.